I've long been fascinated with college sports. I grew up down south where college football is a religion. I saw up close the power of Hoya basketball when I went to Georgetown. And now I've got a son set to play college lacrosse, and that's giving me a whole new window into that world. And as with everything, I see a business story. Right now, a first-year lacrosse player at a Division III school like my son, and Trevor Lawrence, Clemson's championship-winning quarterback and widely touted NFL star, well, they have something in common. Neither of them are allowed to be paid a dime while they play sports at the college level. And that may be about to change. I think 2021 will be a pivotal year for college sports for a lot of reasons. We've been talking about a potential tipping point in college sports. This may be the time with the pandemic, with the racial justice issues, with the activity at the federal and state level, with the activity at the Supreme Court, that we say this is no longer a sustainable model. Schools are conspiring with competitors, agreeing with competitors to pay no salaries to the workers who are making the schools billions of dollars on the theory that consumers want the schools to pay their workers nothing. After years of asking the question, will paying college athletes destroy college athletics? It looks like finally, in 2021, that question will be answered. The tipping point is here. College sports was built on the idea of amateurism. More than 100 years ago, after the death of 18 students and injuries to 150 others, the NCAA was formed as a nonprofit. Its mission? To protect the lives of football players by adding new rules to the sport the biggest being the advent of the forward pass. One of the core tenets, these were not professional athletes. Amateurism is defined in the NCAA's 465-page manual as being motivated primarily by education and by the physical, mental, and social benefits to be derived, protected from exploitation by professional and commercial enterprises. In lieu of paying the players, schools provide athletes with scholarships. But today, between the college football championships, touchdown, Devontae Smith cannot be stopped, and March Madness, how about that? The NCAA is a money-making machine with nearly $19 billion in revenue in 2019 alone. And the students, they still don't get paid. When and how did it get so out of control? Like, was there a catalytic moment or was this just a, a slow bleed, as it were. The explosion in revenues came from another Supreme Court antitrust case called Board of Regents 37 years ago. Jeffrey Kessler is the co-lead counsel for the basketball and football players who are suing the NCAA for greater economic rights. What happened in Board of Regents is the Supreme Court ruled that the NCAA could not restrict the broadcasts of college football and had to allow the conferences and the schools to compete with each other. It led to an explosion in television revenues, both in college football and then derivatively in college basketball. Rather than two networks broadcasting a total of 14 college football games each week, more than 15 networks carry nearly every college football game on TV. More games led to more ad revenue and events like LSU sits on the throne of college football. The college football championship brings in close to half a billion dollars in revenue every year. That revenue ends up influencing how college sports is organized. There was a great kind of realignment, if you will, of a number of, uh, of, the, of the major conferences. This is Amy Privet Perko, executive director of the Knight Commission, an independent group that spearheads reform in college athletics. And that was really done to increase the footprint of those conferences for the football TV market. And what may work for the football TV market may not be the best solution for all the other sport programs. While there are more than 350 Division I basketball schools, there are only 130 in football, also known as the Football Bowl Subdivision, or FBS. That's led to a great imbalance in schools' athletic budgets. FBS college football is the most powerful sport in college sports from the standpoint of the finances and shaping the entire landscape. 
because of the money in football, you have athletic programs in Division One whose budgets are five million dollars a year, and they're competing in the same division in basketball with universities that have athletic department budgets of more than two hundred million dollars a year. College football already rakes in money hand over fist, but the new playoff system is about to make it more profitable than ever. According to CNN, the 64 schools that compete for a spot in that final game brought in a combined $2.8 billion last season. And with billions of dollars now coming into NCAA programs, that money needs to be spent. The phrase they use in economics is rent-seeking behavior. This is my colleague Joe Nocera. Bloomberg opinion writer and author who's been delving into the inequalities of college sports for more than a decade. That means money has to go somewhere. And with Division I basketball and football being the lion's share of where the revenue comes from, the money goes straight back into those programs. Where's it going to go? It goes to the administrators, it goes to the conference commissioners, it goes to the coaches, it goes to the assistant coaches, it goes to the weight coaches, it goes to these fancy buildings. It goes to a new football stadium. Nick Saban makes north of five and a half million dollars a year. Very simply, is he worth it to the University of Alabama? Nick Saban's the best financial investment this university has ever made. About 45 of the 50 states where either the basketball coach or the football coach is the highest paid state employee. However, there is one place that money does not go. They all say, well, we can't afford to pay the players. Of course you can afford to pay the players. You've just chosen not to. For years, the NCAA has made two main arguments. The first... Well, they are paid. We're here to educate them, help them grow as people. We're not here to help them in terms of their financial gain. The second being that paying players would take away from college sports, quote, spirit of amateurism. And some people do agree with those sentiments, even some of the players. I think on the financial side, what the influx of you know, monetary incentives has done is it's just made that process a little bit harder, right? This is Kendall Spencer, former track star at the University of New Mexico, Olympic hopeful, and the first student to ever sit on the NCAA Division I board. When I reflect on just ideally what I would want a student athlete to be thinking about when they were choosing their institution was, you know, where can I go to not only get this great athletic experience and, you know, maybe I'm trying to make an Olympic team or maybe I'm trying to make the professional leagues, but beyond that, where can I go where I get what I need academically so that no matter what happens, I'm going to be successful. Kendall and others argue that this is actually what the current model accomplishes for the vast, vast majority of athletes. They say that reforms shouldn't unduly punish those true student-athletes in the process of reforming a system that's been undermined by two big money sports. So for some, a strong education really is the best compensation they can get for playing college sports. But the money is hard to ignore, and the pandemic made it even harder. Tonight, the NCAA president says there will be no fall championships except for the college football playoff. The money was so important for the universities. They were gonna play football come hell or high water. It didn't really matter if the athletes got COVID. They were gonna play. They'd always said, you know, they're students first and, you know, athletes second and we wanted, they got, they're there for an education. So here you had a situation where most of the rest of the university, in many cases, was not even on campus. We reached out to the NCAA about the health risks posed to players, but they didn't respond. And critics say that the canceling of one sport, but the continuation of another solely because of financial reasons, makes the NCAA's amateurism argument moot. The mythology that D1 basketball and FBS football was just like another extracurricular activity, as if it were, you know, rowing, <laughs> you know, or, or, the, or the newspaper or the drama club when in fact, these have become gigantic businesses that are completely independent of the educational mission of these schools. And in college sports, there was not only the argument that if we pay the players, it will destroy the sport. This is Gabe Fellman. He's a professor of sports law at Tulane University and overall expert on all things NCAA. There was this added layer that if we pay the players, 
that will mean that much of the benefit will flow to a relatively small number of players and the other sports will be hurt. So we'll end up with college football and maybe some men's and women's basketball, but rowing and swimming and diving and golf and lacrosse, that'll all collapse because schools are struggling to make money. So if the pandemic laid bare the importance of college football revenue and the NCAA stood firm on not paying players, could there be a middle ground? I think there were plenty of people who bought that argument, who accepted that we will do damage to college sports as a whole if we provide compensation for football and basketball players. And so name, image, and likeness rights were seen as, I think, a compromise, as a workable solution that would provide benefits for college athletes. Compensation for name, image, and likeness, or NIL, doesn't involve colleges paying players, but does allow athletes to benefit from their accomplishments, as the schools, conferences, TV networks, and others already are. Help me understand how NIL fits into sort of the larger argument. NIL, for the benefit of those watching, are the rights to exploit an athlete's name, image, and likeness. And the payment for those rights doesn't really come from the schools. And that's one of the reasons these schools should not be upset about NIL. It doesn't come out of their pocket. It, 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 it's, it's like, it's like you're making the players happy and you don't have to pay anything. No institutional involvement, no direct or even indirect money from the colleges. Originally, the NIL debate focused around avatars in EA Sports video games. In EA NCAA Basketball 09, an unnamed UCLA player looked exactly like and played the same position as Ed O'Bannon, a former UCLA basketball player. This led to O'Bannon v. NCAA, an antitrust class action lawsuit filed against the NCAA that challenged their use of its athletes' likeness for commercial purposes. I don't think we can overlook the impact that Ed O'Bannon has had on this when he filed his lawsuit to try to get compensation for former and current college athletes. He lost the case, at least as it pertained to NIL, but I think he showed a path forward, and I think he helped start to convince people that it's possible to both save and protect college sports, and maybe even strengthen college sports, while also providing more rights for college athletes. While the Supreme Court ultimately declined to hear the O'Bannon case, the focus for NIL has now shifted away from video games and towards social media. It's hard to ignore that this is no longer just about the traditional endorsement deal. This is no longer just about the star athlete getting the deal with the apparel company. And the opportunities that has provided for young people in this innovation economy, when an athlete comes on campus and they have more than a million followers, why can't they then monetize their popularity? If you're a musician, you can record something and you can get paid. Everyone else at the school is allowed to take advantage if you have those opportunities, except the athletes who want to play NCAA sports. Katie Ledecky, probably the most famous swimmer in the country right now, actually had to resign from competing any longer on the Stanford swimming team because the loss of her potential revenues got to a point where in consultation with her family, she just said she couldn't give it up any longer. There should be some requirements for transparency and institutions should not be involved in setting up these deals. And there should be no use of the institutional mark. Because again, this is about allowing the individuals as athletes to be able to um, benefit from their name, image, and likeness, not that of the university. One thing NIL and directly paying the players have in common is the NCAA has fought against both for decades. So why do you think they resist it so much? Because that's the system. They resist it because that's the way it's always been. They do worry about the disparity between the quarterback getting a car ad and hit the center getting nothing. The yeah. reality is, and that's what our antitrust laws established, is competition leads generally to more fan interest, more revenues, and a fairer allocation of the revenues to the people who actually generate them. And over the past few years, the fight for NIL has gotten messy. With no action by the NCAA and no national standard, individual states chose to step in. 
In September 2019, California initiated the Fair Pay to Play Act that allowed athletes to be paid for their name, image, and likeness. Other states like Florida followed suit, and on top of all that, the Supreme Court has heard oral arguments in the pivotal NCAA versus Alston case, with judges making arguments in both directions and some staying above the fray. It's a tough case for me. This is not an ordinary product. So I worry a lot about judges getting into the business of deciding how amateur sports should be run. One of the things that it, it's hard for, I think, an outsider to, to totally comprehend is you've got California, you've got Florida, you've got the Supreme Court, you've got the NCAA. Like, when you cut through it, wh where does this really kind of come down to? Like, who ultimately is going to be sort of the the decider here. There is a legitimate reason why you want one set of NIL rules, right? Because otherwise you really get into the, this, this thing where 50 states have 50 different rules and it's a, it's a mess. We are with, dealing with a situation I've compared to the NCAA is now juggling fiery knives and the knives that are up in the air are an amateurism antitrust decision. There's Activity at the state level, the federal level, the Supreme Court level, there are lawsuits still being filed. There's the NIL legislation, there's the public pressure, and there's frankly not even agreement within the NCAA about what the right path forward is. You'd have recruiting advantages, you know, based on what your NIL is in California versus what your NIL is in Maryland. The most logical place for this to be sorted out is Congress. I want to save college sports. But I don't necessarily think that kids shouldn't get any share of the money that is increasingly making people in this industry millionaires. That's Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut, a diehard UConn fan and one of the most outspoken members of Congress when it comes to NIL. And that's why I've introduced legislation that would create a, a federal right uh, to make money off of your name, image, and likeness. And that's why I'm supportive of broader efforts that would you know, create some federal expectations around broader revenue sharing uh, with student athletes. Senator Murphy isn't the only member of Congress taking on NIL. His co-sponsor in the House is Representative Lori Trahan of Massachusetts, who herself is a former D1 volleyball player at Georgetown. Go Hoyas. Another bill in Congress, the College Athletes Bill of Rights, was introduced by Cory Booker and Richard Blumenthal, both Democrats from New Jersey and Connecticut, respectively. It seeks, quote, fair and equitable compensation for college athletes. We reached out to the NCAA for comment, and they directed us to a written statement reading, the board of directors remains fully committed to providing student athletes with appropriate opportunities within the collegiate model by modernizing division one rules related to name, image, and likeness and transfer eligibility at the first practicable opportunity. If we're going to make a good case for Congress, they need to understand that all the universities within the NCAA want to see the same outcome because timing is critical here because we're frankly at a point where the first state law will go into effect in July and we're leading toward chaos. That's not going to be good for athletes or the universities. And so what do you worry about kind of getting in the way? What are the obstacles here to getting this done? This industry is incredibly powerful. I, I think that you know, the Power Five schools um, are not going to be interested in changing the status quo. And I think that's largely because the power now exists in individual school athletic programs and individual conferences, not in the NCAA. And he's right. The power in decision making for allocating revenue has shifted from the NCAA to what's called the Power Five, or the five most prestigious athletic conferences in America. And one of the things that um, a lot of sports fans, college sports fans, uh, for example, don't really understand is that the NCAA does not control the college football playoff. And the $500 million a year generated by the college football playoff is handled independently of the NCAA. The FBS institutions receive that funding. This fits into sort of some even bigger questions, it feels like, around how colleges operate, how they spend their money. It's long overdue to have a conversation about recalibrating revenue and costs in college sports, also recalibrating the governance structure 
in Division One sports, and, and the Knight Commission has been looking into these issues for a very long time and continues to do so. There's significant opportunities here because the growth in the media revenues is not going to go away. We've seen over time it continues to increase in college sports. Some of the challenges really are a result of its success in media revenues, but we haven't met the moment of the challenges by changing the system, by changing the incentives to really ensure that those revenues are going to the right places and going to support a healthy system across all sports, not just football and basketball. While much is made of how much money pours into and swirls around big time college football and basketball, Senator Murphy and other proponents of NIL reform say the biggest beneficiaries may not be the star athletes like Trevor Lawrence and Zion Williamson, who would simply be getting a down payment on a future fortune. The real winners may be athletes at top tier college programs, like the fabled UConn women's basketball team, some of whom may ultimately eke out a living playing professional basketball, but whose best chance of being compensated for their talents may come in college. Managing a vaccine rollout and an ensuing economic recovery will likely push Senator Murphy's bill and other legislation until later in the year. In the meantime, we'll get a look at how athletes may or may not benefit from state legislation. The NCAA may opt to take this issue up again, and the Supreme Court will likely issue its ruling by the summer. 2021 may bring some semblance of change, or it could bring an entirely new business model to college sports, one that actually includes the athletes. Thanks so much for watching. Would love to hear what you think about this and other episodes about the business of sports. I'll be in the comments section. Can't wait to hear what you think.